Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us at our um, monthly criminal justice meeting. We um, open it up for anyone who wants to be a part of the criminal justice meeting. A couple of things that we are working on in the criminal justice committee is alternatives to incarceration. We look at racial profiling issues and we look for um, any type of support that we can actually get as it relates to criminal justice reform. Um, so we have been having um, our guests from the justice, criminal justice um, arena uh, actually come and be before us. And tonight we are honored to have our district attorney, Ms. Sherry Boston, come and uh, provide to us kind of uh, um, some education behind what the DA's office does and then some of the actual um, programs and initiatives that the office is doing. I think people often don't know what the DA's office does unless they see it on TV, like we just went through uh, with the Chauvin trial. Um, but I want her to be able to explain that to us in the criminal justice so that we can actually support her. The other thing that we want to make sure um, uh, DA Sheriff Boston knows is that if there's something that we could ever do um, in support of some of your program initiatives, the NAACP is um, here to do that. And at this time, I want to introduce to you our the cab <laughs> district attorney, uh, Sherry Boston. Thank you, Teresa, so much um, uh, for inviting me. Thank you so much to the NAACP for inviting me. It is an honor and a privilege to be here um, to speak to you and to answer your questions today and talk to you about the work of the district attorney's office. Um, however, I would be remiss if I didn't take a uh, a personal moment of privilege to um, acknowledge um, what we just witnessed in the last um, two hours, um, which is um, a measure of justice for the Floyd family. And I say a measure of justice because uh, full justice would have uh, Mr. Floyd home and alive with his family, um, but he is not. Um, so this is a measure of justice for their family. Um, it is uh, a moment in history for us as a country that we are seeing a police officer held to the fullest extent of the law um, for a abuse of their power and authority. Um, but uh, this is not the end of the road. Um, and I wanna acknowledge that um, it is through the work of organizations like the NAACP and those of you that are on this call um, who have lent their voice um, to the systemic um, and pervasive racism that exists in our criminal justice system um, and, and exists in our policing community. And I like to say all the time, I am a part of that community, but we must acknowledge um, that racism, we must acknowledge that hurt, that pain, we must acknowledge the, the wrongdoings in order for us to build, uh, instill, and continue to work to build, not rebuild, build community trust. Um, because our community has never trusted us. Um, and I can only hope that um, the message sent today by the work of um, Attorney General Keith Ellison's office with the help of the DA in Hennepin County um, that we can begin to turn a page, a corner, um, that we will seek justice, that justice will be served. Um, and we get to a point where we're not saying any more names because there are no names to be said. Um, so I wanted to start off by acknowledging that um, and, and by saying how difficult these cases can be to prove and how proud I am of the prosecutor's office that showed that when we do right, we can be right for our community. So I'm, uh, I'm Sherry Boston, um, for those of you that I've not had the opportunity to met, and it has been my honor and it is my privilege to serve as the DeKalb County District Attorney. So a little bit about me, um, I assumed the role of District Attorney in January of 2017, um, but prior to that, um, many of you know that I served for six years as the DeKalb County Solicitor General. 
Um, and prior to that, I had the privilege of serving as a defense lawyer, as a municipal court judge, as a magistrate court judge. Um, and I got to the practice of law by way of graduating from Villanova University, go Wildcats, um, and Emory University School of Law, which is what brought me to DeKalb County. Um, and after graduating, I um, loved this community so much that I had a desire to stay. And, and it is a, a privilege to be uh, serving the community of where I first landed coming here. So let me talk to you a little bit about the role of the district attorney. Um, it is a constitutional uh, officer. It is required under the constitution that I represent the state in all criminal proceedings in superior court and juvenile court of my circuit and other duties required by law. Um, even though everyone calls us the DeKalb DA's office, technically our name is the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit. Um, that is the circuit for which I am um, a district attorney. Uh, there are 49 DAs or 49 judicial circuits, uh, soon to potentially be 50. If the governor signs the bill splitting the Augusta circuit, we will have 50 judicial circuits and 50 district attorneys. Um, district attorneys prosecute felony cases. Um, and where there is a solicitor general who prosecutes misdemeanor offenses. Um, in some jurisdictions where there is not a solicitor general, that DA has the authority to prosecute um, or handles all cases. Although keeping in mind that my office can prosecute a misdemeanor, it's just that we have exclusive jurisdiction over felonies and the solicitor's office can handle those misdemeanors. And that's why um, the vast majority of misdemeanors go to the solicitor's office. Um, and as an elected official, um, it is my role to be responsive and accountable to the community in which um, I serve. So let me talk to you a little bit about our mission and vision. This was a statement that I created with my team my first year in office. It is on our website. It is what we share with every new employee. And it is the backbone of... Um, how we view our role. Um, and so the mission of the Office of the DeKalb County District Attorney is to safeguard our community through the vigorous and fair prosecution of felony offenses occurring within the Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit. We seek to accomplish this goal by preserving the dignity and best interests of our victims while using smart prosecution strategies that balance offender accountability with prevention, intervention, and restorative justice. We believe in the power of engagement and in building relationships with community partners for the betterment of DeKalb County. In our vision, we endeavor to restore faith in the criminal justice system and disrupt cycles of violence, trauma, and recidivism in our pursuit of public now, safety see, and injustice. This video is from a French source. So you'll see the word joy. Okay, thank you. Um, and so you'll see this tagline at the bottom of our screen, the bottom of my mission statement, and it's engage, protect, restore. And that's the tagline that encompasses what we wanna do with our community. Uh, we want to engage, the community we serve. We want to protect the community we, restore, we, we serve. And we want to restore trust in the criminal justice system. And that's, that's, that is how we approach all the work that we do. So what does using smart prosecution strategies mean to me? Well, it means that we wanna balance offender accountability with prevention, intervention, and restorative justice. So let me just talk to you a little bit about how I view the prosecutor's role and how I feel that role has changed over the time period. So the traditional role in prosecution has been that a prosecutor reacts to crime, is isolated from the community, has very little communication with the community, which resulted over decades a mistrust of the criminal justice system. 
When I talk about smart prosecution, and some people use the word progressive prosecution, but I view it as smart. Um, I don't want to use, a, I feel like a word progressive can be um, a word that is mislabeled, misused, and, and oftentimes you will see people feel like, well, if you're progressive, it means that you don't really want to prosecute. And that's absolutely not the truth. But what I want to do as a prosecutor is that I want to be smart about my decisions. And being smart about our decisions means protecting our community while also trying to inflict as little harm as possible within that same community. So how do we do that? We do that by proactively addressing crime, meaning we're not waiting for files to come, come across our desk. We are to be a person that moves, you know, file to file to file, but we want to understand the needs of our community and we want to address the crime within the community, hopefully even stopping crime before it happens. And we do that by seeking community partnerships. It means that we have to be engaged with the community in which we serve. We can't just separate ourselves out and feel like we're not engaged with that community. It requires open communication. Um, just this uh, forum that I'm speaking at tonight is just one part or one way that we work on communication. It means I'm engaging um, at every level and continuing to tell people what we're doing, um, be accountable to your questions, your concerns, and your critiques. And we feel but that by doing all of these things, we are instilling trust in the criminal justice system um, and helping people to, to see uh, the work we're doing and be transparent in an effort that we can have more faith. So um, smart approaches. So beginning with the ending in mind, we look at what results right? Do we want for the community? What results do we want for the victim? And what results do we want for the offender? And we have to think about every piece of that puzzle when we talk about a smart approach to prosecution, because it's not just, although, you know, a victim may be singular in their pain, um, the community and the person charged also may feel the ramifications of not only the incident that happens, but the prosecution and then what happens next. Because we know that um, oftentimes our victims are offenders and our offenders are victims and they all live primarily in the same community because we're talking about our homes, we're talking about DeKalb County. So most of the time, most of what's happening are people that ultimately have to go back and live in the same community or their families have to live in the same community or they know each other or they know their neighbors or their friends know that or the people involved. So we have to understand that there is a result for every part of the community and you have to be thinking about each of those parts. So I wanna spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the restorative approaches that we have in our office. And I'm gonna to touch on pretrial diversion, accountability courts, our stride youth program, our approach to juvenile SB 440s, reentry, and then racial, racial justice and office culture. And these are just a few of the ways that um, we have tackled these issues. And I picked these out tonight because in talking with Teresa, um, I know that this group was particularly interested um, in criminal justice reform and restorative justice. So I say that to say there's a lot more things that we do in the DA's office, um, but I was asked um, to, to really give you a drill down on these areas. And so that's what I'll be covering this evening. So diversion as a restorative justice option. Diversion is good because for our victims, um, oftentimes we can get restitution, um, you know, stay aways, relief from court proceedings, meaning we're taking it out of the court, um, which um, for a lot of people, they don't want to be in the court system, but they still want restitution. 
For the offender, there's the opportunity to avoid a criminal record while making it right with the victim as well as the community. And then for the community, there's less recidivism, there's less cost to taxpayers for justice, there's more employable citizens coming away from the justice system. So diversion, which um, is an option where, for those of you that don't know what diversion is, it means we're diverting cases away from the criminal justice system. We're determining that there are certain offenses or certain people that we can resolve their matters without a criminal charge, but there is an opportunity for them to make amends um, for the hurt, the pain, or the loss that they have caused to a victim or the community. Procedural justice of diversion. So it is voluntary and participants are still advised of their constitutional rights, including a right to attorney before entry. But to do diversion, it is voluntary in nature. We don't force anyone, we can't force anyone. Someone has to decide they wanna participate. They receive instructions on the completion and they get copies of all the agreements and guidelines of what they need to complete and do in order for their case to be dismissed. And of course, a dismissal also means that their record is eligible for restriction. And we also made some adjustments during COVID-19. Um, prior to COVID-19, we had fee waivers for indigents. Um, but since COVID-19 has hit, we have made the decision not to charge any fees for our diversion program recognizing that our community is significantly underemployed and unemployed during um, these COVID times. And we didn't want that to be a barrier to justice. Um, and frankly, um, you know, as I think about what we've done by removing the fees from our program, I'm not sure that I'll ever reinstate them um, because it's just a reminder that we wanna continue to make sure that there are no barriers um, to our program. I believe that our program can really sustain itself well. Um, and once again, we don't want to be um, a driver or a prevention of people getting justice because they can't afford it. And so that's um, been another wake up call for me as I, I go through this process of learning and growing and trying to best serve our community. I recognize that I still every day have to really take a good look at the work that I'm doing and making sure that I'm growing with it. So we also are involved with accountability courts. The difference between diversion and accountability courts are the diversion programs are led and created and handled by prosecutors, meaning it is outside the criminal justice system. You, uh, it is, there are generally, it's done without any charges. Um, a judge doesn't have to sign off on anything. Um, accountability courts are different. In DeKalb County, all of our accountability courts are judicially run. We have a drug court, a mental health court, and a veterans court. And those all fall under the purview of the judges. So it means that um, it is a program run by them, although we make referrals for cases but at the same time, it is run um, under their auspice um, and it is a part of the criminal justice system. So for victims of crime, they often want an offender to get treatment. And these are of course, people with substance abuse problems, mental health problems, and then in particular veterans courts were set up to deal with the mental health issues that sometimes are very singular to our veterans. And also the fact that um, the uh, Veteran Affairs Office offers some very specific programs that are only available to veterans. And so by partnering with them and creating a veterans court, we can tap into those resources that those veterans are eligible for that perhaps that other folks with mental health issues would not be able to access. And so that's why we have a separate court um, for veterans. Um, and so for the offender, they receive rehabilitative and social services administered in a way that fosters their own personal accountability. And then, of course, for the community, there's a lower risk of reoffense than those who go through incarceration. Because again, um, when you're incarcerated, you are perhaps 
very often not getting the type of treatment that you need. And what we found is that folks that are in these programs, their criminal um, actions are being fueled um, by a substance abuse disorder or a mental health disorder. And so the key is, is that the only way to fix that, to stop the criminal activity is to um, deal with the underlying social issues. And so um, that's why accountability courts are so very important. So I wanna talk about our STRIDE program. This is a new program that we launched just before COVID hit. And we actually had to shift um, uh, to a virtual format in the midst of COVID. Um, so STRIDE stands for Stopping Trends of Repeat Incarceration with Diversion and Education. It is a program aimed at youth 17 to 24. It offers the same benefits to victim, offender, and community as diversion and accountability options. This is, in fact, a diversion program. The difference in this program, though, is, is that we offer a tremendous amount of services that are um, tailored for youth um, who need a little bit more help um, in seeking, um, you know, their best selves. Um, and like I said, this program recognizes that um, at this stage, um, our youth are not fully developed in their brains and they're still taking a lot of risks um, and that they need a lot more guidance to interrupt that cycle of recidivism. Um, and so uh, this is a great picture of some of our staff members with some of our participants. So you'll see we have put uh, start out their faces. Um, but um, it has been a very successful program for us aimed at stopping um, the, our folks from graduating to larger crimes or crimes that force them into incarceration. So elements of STRIDE include cognitive behavioral therapy, addressing their thinking. They do civic education and engagement, um, community service days, um, were in place. We could not do those during the COVID pandemic, but it is a part of our program. They have to make a level of restitution to the victim. And that doesn't necessarily mean financial. It means um, they are expected to confront um, and, and write, apologize, and come and become accountable for, for the harm that they've caused an individual victim and or their community. And then of course there's education and career assistance. And we're super proud of that program because we think that we, are, we have a real opportunity to divert young people away from the criminal justice system. And let me just say like, remember our office is prosecuting felonies and our diversion program is for what we call our, for mainly our low level nonviolent offenses. When I'm talking about stride, these are young people that have committed crimes that are on that next tier. Um, they are not obviously crimes that are murder, rape, or armed robbery because those are mandatory minimum crimes and require incarceration. But these are crimes that you normally would see people going to jail for, um, whether it's burglary uh, or robbery and some other things that we start to see our young people get involved in that we know can lead to those um, high level felonies where incarceration is, uh, is, is a mandatory minimum. So uh, our STRIDE program is next level when we talk about diversion. And we are dealing with crimes that um, most of our community members are really concerned about. But we feel like this is a program when we identify um, young people that we think would be willing and, and able to participate, that we really can turn the corner with them. And that's been really exciting. So the next thing I want to talk is about our juvenile protocol, um, and that's the protocol for charging as an adult. Um, so on the left side of your screen, you're going to see what we call the seven deadlies. You've probably heard this before. 
Um, the seven deadlies are considered the most serious crimes for adults in the adult criminal justice system. Murder, kidnapping with injury, armed robbery, rape, aggravated child molestation, aggravated sodomy, and aggravated sexual battery. All of these types of charges carry mandatory minimums and people are facing decades, if not life, in prison. Um, when we talk about SB 440s, um, those are cases where juveniles um, can be charged as adults, despite the fact that they have not yet re reached the age of 17. Um, and the age of 17 is the age of adults for the criminal justice system currently um, under the law. We've been trying for several legislative sessions to raise the age um, but that has um, still been very unsuccessful here in Georgia. And Georgia remains only one of two states um, where the age still remains at um, uh, uh, 17 or, or if you like to say above 16 or below 17. But SB 440s are a category of crimes that regardless of your age, you could be charged as an adult. Um, and those are a little bit more of an exhaustive list. So it's murder, murder in the second degree, voluntary manslaughter, armed robbery with a firearm, rape, aggravated child molestation, aggravated sodomy, aggravated sexual battery, aggravated assault with a firearm of a police, of a public officer, and then aggravated battery of a public officer. And it just means if you're charged with one of those offenses as a juvenile, your case, um, you are eligible to be charged as adult and your case will start out in superior court, in adult court, um, that's where it starts. So what do we do and what is our protocol? Well, I will tell you there are some DA's offices across the state where they don't have a protocol, meaning if they had a, a juvenile charged with any of those offenses, they would prosecute that case in superior court, no questions, no exceptions. Mm -hmm. That is not how we handle juveniles in um, DeKalb County. So as I stated, jurisdiction starts in superior court. That's where it starts. Unlike all other juvenile offenses that start in juvenile court. But any of those cases can be transferred to juvenile court at the discretion of the DA. Um, and that's prior to indictment. And so one of the things that we do is we have a very proactive treatment. Our cases are investigated. We consult with defense attorneys and we try to get as much information about a young person or about the facts of the case prior to a charging decision. And we only really have a short window of time to make these decisions in juvenile cases. Um, the case is staffed by office leaders and assessed using evaluation factors to make decisions between juvenile or adult proceedings. And we created this process where I meet um, with my deputy chiefs um, and the attorneys assigned to these cases, and we literally do a case review to make decisions on all SB 440 cases and whether that case would be better served, meaning whether that youth is better served by being in the auspices of juvenile court. Um, and so we make those decisions with care and with concern and what's best for the child and the community at the same time. We also assist with re-entry. So we do record, we help with record restrictions. We do retroactive first offender petitions. We do vacatures, which is just a fancy way of saying restrictions. Um, and we have started uh, doing particularly vacatures for victims of human trafficking, meaning we have victims that are, we, if we can identify that you were a, a victim of human trafficking, then oftentimes we find that our victims that are in this world manage to receive a lot of criminal charges from drug offenses to prostitution offenses because they're viewed um, as a person participating in criminal activity. And what we found is that as victims, they may have a long history of criminal charges, but it's all associated to them being exploited. So we've worked really hard um, to identify victims and make sure that they are not saddled with long criminal histories based on their victimization. 
And finally, um, office uh, race and office culture. So it was really important to me to make sure that um, we looked at this issue um, and not just looked at it, we wanted to make strides because um, again, when I said in the beginning of this presentation, acknowledgement is a very important step to in instilling community trust. Um, and so acknowledgement that our criminal justice system was built on the backs of systemic racism is something that um, we all have to be comfortable with saying, and we all have to be comfortable with it. Those are the facts. But it doesn't mean that we can't work through them and work to be better. And so my entire staff, from prosecutors to receptionists, received eight hours of implicit bias training. We became the first and the only district attorney's office, the only prosecution office in the entire state of Georgia to, to do this for our staff. Um, and it's a reoccurring process um, because every year I get tons of new employees. And so every year we offer this training so that we have a continuing implicit bias training in our office. We have partnered and we're selected by the Vera Institute of Justice as just one of three um, prosecution offices in the country to examine how race affects sentencing into CAB. And so we have been working through that project. COVID stalled us just a little bit because we couldn't be in person, but I agreed to turn over all of the data for the past five to seven years for them to analyze, for them to tell us what we look like meaning how race is playing a part in our sentencing and our charging decisions um, and how um, we could do better when it comes to challenging um, race within the criminal justice system. And that restoration requires that we examine how racism, implicit bias, and systemic racism affect how we strive for justice. And these are areas and issues that we talk about in our office and have made a part of our office culture. Um, so with that, um, that is my presentation and I've been timing myself a little bit. And so I think I'm right at about 30 minutes. Um, and so I, of course, want to open it up for to have an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, great job, uh, DA. Let me see. We have a few questions in the chat. So um, if I could, I will read those uh, questions and, and then you can answer um, okay, so from George Chidi, um, he wants to, he has a couple of questions. Um, where do things stand right now with the mental health court in DeKalb County and Diversion? And then says, what resources outside of the court are necessary for Diversion around mental health and drug treatment to be more effective? Okay, great question. And George, it's good to see you, my friend, even though I can't see your face on the screen. So let me just break down a couple of things. So our diversion programs or our diversion program is not a program that is suited for anyone with mental health issues or substance abuse or, uh, disorders. Um, the diversion program that we run is specifically for those that can um, self-regulate through a program. It usually involves community service and restitution. So that's one category of people. That's for people that we feel like have made some mistakes, low level offenses, and can self-motivate and be held self-accountable with little to no assistance from us. Then when you talk about our mental health court, that falls squarely in our accountability programs. And so all of our accountability programs have partnerships, for services and provide those services through the court system. And that's a partnership with the court, the public defender's office, my office. There is an accountability court coordinator that works for the superior court that is responsible for getting, you know, grant funding and um, service providers for those programs. And so that would be your drug court, your mental health court and your veterans court. And then as I talked about, our STRIDE program is one that does offer services. And we've been lucky to partner with work source development and also some counseling services that we pay for out of the DA's office's um, 
um, out of JAG funds, grant funds, to make sure that we can pay for those counseling and services. Um, so that's kind of um, what we're tapping into. And we are always trying to tap into what our community partners may be able to offer, especially for um, prosecution run programs. The accountability courts, again, those are judicially run um, and they have a lot of mandates that they have to comply with the state. So it's a little bit different, um, but I know that they're also always um, looking for resources or uh, avenues of which they can provide services for people. Got it. Uh, the thing I'm specifically wondering is to what degree you believe that the the effectiveness of the, these accountability courts may be constrained by resources that aren't in your control. Things like um, housing or drug treatment or uh, other services that you are counting on partners to provide. Um, I imagine that the courts and your office is doing well, but you you don't run a housing program. So if you're if the barrier for somebody to emerge from an accountability court is something related to housing or health, you're counting on someone else. I'm wondering to what degree you believe that the linkages between your, your office and these programs and all of the other services providers is strong enough. I'm wondering where we should be, who we should be leaning on in order to make you more effective in this regard. So this is a debate that rolls on. And I and I and let me just start off by saying this. Um, I don't want anyone to think that my remarks are critical of accountability courts because accountability courts do play um, a, a critical role in the criminal justice system. But I will say that the, the number of people that really qualify for accountability courts, meaning they check off the boxes that make accountability court um, effective for them is a small number compared to the people that we really want to serve. And I think that's what you're speaking to, George, and that is the issue. There is a category of people um, that, you know, because really accountability court is for people that have committed offense where honestly, there's a carrot dangling on a stick meaning there's a reason for them to go into accountability court because they are potentially facing um, a, a, a number of years of incarceration for the offense to which they have alleged have committed. But if you are just a substance abuse user, right? And you are only charged with minor offenses around personal possession, there is not that carrot for those folks. And they really aren't in my opinion, well suited for accountability court because there is no, so to your answer, yes, we see every day that there are a category of people um, that are not, there's, there's no place for them. And if I'm being honest, like uh, one could argue that none of these folks should be in the criminal justice system, right? And that's true. And that's where we talk about where are the resources, what can the community step in to fill those gaps? Um, and, and really, for me, I would like to see those resources built up so that none of this has to even come into the criminal justice system. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of being selected as one of a dozen or so prosecutors that got, um, uh, was able to go to Portugal back in 2019 where I was able to tour and understand how Portugal has approached their substance abuse disorder. And I will tell you, it was really revolutionary for me. Um, and it really helped start framing for me this notion about harm reduction, um, about substance abuse disorder and taking it out of the criminal justice system. But I will tell you, the, what, we, what I saw in Portugal the one thing, well, not just one thing, but the main thing that we don't have here in the United States that makes that so successful is the public health piece. Because when they filter that through their healthcare system, because their healthcare system is free and open to everyone. So they're able to remove folks that get stopped for possessing drugs or have a drug problem immediately into services and the public health there. Um, and that's what I, I said to myself, 
that's the missing link because we can't guarantee all of the people in our country have access to healthcare. And if they don't have access to healthcare, they don't have access to treatment, residential or otherwise. Um, so it is a public health crisis. And I'm glad we're starting to have these conversations, but we need to have more of them. And it's not just a DeKalb dynamic. I mean, it's a United States of America, America dynamic. All right, thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks, George. Uh, yeah, someone did ask about um, what community partners do you work with? Oh, just about everybody. I mean, anybody from, I mean, listen, when we say community partner, I think that of that as any organization that was is within this community, whether it's because our building is housed here or because we serve people here. It could be an advocacy group. It could be a church. It could be an HOA. It certainly can be the NAACP. We consider every organization um, a part of our community. So anybody can be a community partner with us. Okay. You also have individuals that can be partners, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, and um, the next question is, what percentage of DeKalb felony cases are diverted to a participative, participative restorative justice process agreed to by the victim and charged offender? Oh, wow. I don't have those numbers handy, um, but I can provide those later and tell you exactly how many cases we diverted. Um, but right now, I will be honest and say it's smaller than I would like. And we're working to improve that. And I can forecast a little bit that um, I can't roll it out just yet because we're still rolling it out. But we have created a policy around how we're going to handle cases given the backlog of COVID-19. Uh, and we have made some, some, some charging decisions on what we're going to move forward with and what resources we, we don't have. Um, so you're going to you're gonna see some, some changes coming up in 2021. Well, so what would be some of the challenges then if you said you said it's lower than what you think? So is there some like one or two challenges that's causing it to be so low? Um, think? Uh -huh. So we are we we are trying to be open right mm -hmm. now to the possibility mm -hmm. of expanding the types of charges that we would divert. That's okay. the first thing, right? The okay. second thing is again, it's a voluntary program and there's always gonna be folks that choose not to participate. But I would say right now, uh, the, the piece that lands on my feet, because I can't make people do diversion, is for me to really examine um, eligibility, right? Mm -hmm. And so we continue to look at what makes sense okay. for us to divert. All right, that's good. Um, how does your office participate in ending money bail and keeping misdemeanor offenders out of jail by allowing signature bonds? Okay, so um, just a reminder that we do not handle misdemeanor offenses. So if some if a case comes into my office, it's a felony charge. Now it could have misdemeanors added on, but if uh, normally speaking, if that case is coming to my office, we're looking at the felony. Um, so misdemeanor prosecution lies with the Solicitor General's office um, and that's where those go. As far as cash bail, um, I certainly support and I have signed on that we need to look at reforming that system. But I will say to you, um, our cases are felonies. And so where we're asking for a bond, we're doing so because we believe that person um, is either a threat to the community, a flight risk, um, or a threat to um, a victim or to intimidate witnesses. Um, and those are our policies. And where we don't have those things, my staff is instructed um, to not seek, um, you know, uh, heavy levels of cash bail. But I do think DeKalb still has to grow in this area. Um, but certainly, I think the first step is with misdemeanor offenses, because um, that's really where the issue and concern around cash bail reform is, is misdemeanor offenses. Um, but felony offenses, I think, you know, we continue to need um, a, a, a way um, to make sure that we are not releasing people back into the community that can be harmful. But we do need to talk about what's the best way to do that without attaching it to um, money.
Yeah, and and I, just FYI, we did support, and that goes back to the community uh, partnerships, um, the um, misdemeanors that have signature bonds now, mm -hmm. um, and that was done um, April 18, 2018. Um, as a core group, all of us came together on that. Um, I think the it, in our discussions about it, it was a little harder to do it from a felony perspective, but if we could look at something where... What I found is a lot of the cases come, it's not just a felony case. It's, I mean, it's more than one charge. <laughs> that may be a lot more charges to look at, but if it came to you and it wasn't one of the deadly, um, seven deadly, um, what you call yeah, them? Sands. Okay. Um, so yeah, if it didn't have those, um, is, is there something we can look into to see where we can kind of um, uh, do signature bonds or something? So, um, you know, first, let me just say this. Um, there's been, there's, there, has, there has to be some analysis and evidence because it's, it's really the issue of whether that person is a danger to the community or again, to a victim or a witness. And it goes beyond a seven deadly case. Like for example, um, if someone's charged with a second offense of family violence battery, that's a felony case, right? Um, and in those cases, oftentimes, if you're talking about someone that has committed a second offense, family violence battery, you know, we have to consider what's happening in that home with children and victims. Um, and so um, that's just one example where we can't have a blanket rule like just the seven deadlies, because honestly, we know that. Uh -oh. <laughs> what is that? Sorry, there's like I heard that too. Okay, y'all. Like, is it thundering? No. No, 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 no. I don't know what's happening, but my kids heard it. We all heard it. <laughs> um, but you know, second family violence battery is just an example of some of people. You know, you 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 kind of view that as it's not a seven deadly sin. And honestly, second family violence batteries, you might not even be facing. You're not facing minimum time a a, a, a mandatory minimum after conviction, but we know those are some of our most dangerous cases, not only to the, the victims, the family members in their household, but to law enforcement, um, because domestic violence calls are some of the most um, uh, dangerous when law enforcement goes out to um, you know, uh, issue an arrest warrant or search warrant. So we really have to do it on an evidence base. And so there are some states that have brought in like these algorithm mm -hmm. models to do these individual case assessments to determine if an individual is considered a danger. I have seen some and some of it is good, but some of it is equally bad because we're talking about algorithms and we don't trust algorithms and we want our judges to hear these things. So this is a debate that we have to be very careful about when we're talking about um, violent offenses, even violent offenses that aren't rising to the level of seven deadly sins. That's right. Okay, we'll move on. Um, that was me adding that in. So no, no problem. <laughs> we're really into this. Uh, the cash bail thing. So I, I wanted to know, um, are other, oh no, oh, sorry. Is there an age restriction on juveniles, even if they have major crimes being deemed as juvenile versus adult prosecution? You mean how young? Is that the question? Yeah, okay. That's okay. Speaking. Um, and I see Ashika Penn, my juvenile chief on here. I just want to say hello to her. Um, but, uh, the age is actually, at tw it's above 12. Am I right on that, Sheikah? Or is it 14? Can you? Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's 13. It's 13. 13. You're right. 13. That's it. I was, you saw, I said 12 or 14. It's 13. So it is 13. Anything below 13, you are, they are deemed uh, in, incompetent, is the word I'm going to use um, for to be held responsible for their charges. Can I follow up with that just a second? Yeah, sure. So the, uh, there was a young man that I think stole a vehicle and had the big little kid in it, brought the kid to somebody's house that was unknown, but he's charged as an adult. Is that right when it's not one of the, those major sevens? 
Well, what you will see is that uh, it, the second side of the list, mm -hmm. um, it would fall under the second side, which are cases that can be charged as an adult. Um, and I, I can't speak um, on the facts of that case because obviously that's in the evaluation process. Yeah, understood, understood. But I, what, this is what I will say to you. Um, that case, because we have a protocol, uh, we are looking at it through the lens of our protocol to make a decision on what we think um, is best uh, for the community and for the juvenile involved in that incident. Awesome, thank you. I think it's also a good opportunity for restorative. Yes. yes opportunity, just, just, you know. So, uh, well, let me just say this one thing about restorative justice and <laughs> um, juveniles. And I'm gonna use juvenile all the way up to about 23, 24. Okay. And we're still working through this. Okay. Juvenile uh, restorative justice really only works when you have two sides that are willing to actively engage in the process in a meaningful way. Right. That means we have to have a victim that's willing to sit down here and potentially accept an apology. Mm -hmm. We also have to have an offender that can articulate the harm they've caused understand the harm they've caused and be willing to apologize for it. Mm -hmm. What I will say to you, because we've looked at a couple of cases that it's difficult mm -hmm. with the juveniles whose brains aren't yet fully formed yeah. for them to participate in a process, especially with adults mm -hmm. around accepting accountability for their actions. So that is, that's a little bit of, you know, and that's why juvenile court is so awesome because it's not going to force that 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 circle mm -hmm. because those kids may not yet be ready mm -hmm. to articulate what they need to articulate in order for a victim to feel like they understand what they did okay. but we continue to work on that well you know what and just to just piggyback out there i understand it from that perspective um and da sharon um I'm thinking more for because he because a person is that age, it's now more restorative, not just for him, but it may be on his parents' side and also the community side. I'm looking at more of a not just him and the victim, but the impact was not just to those two, it was the impact of the whole community. It was. And that's what I thought about more of the restorative opportunity. And maybe, maybe that's the word I use instead of justice, because the justice part is you, you messed up, you did something, right? But to me, there's other reasons to, there may be other reasons for that behavior where that's where I'm looking at the resources from the community, like the church, the, the social or in civic organizations to kind of help mold, because at some point, we're going to have to face the fact that even though you do something, you get whooped or spanked for it behavioral, but you gotta come back and do right. Okay, I, 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 hey, okay, I grew up in the country. I believe yeah. in spankings, okay? So <laughs> it worked on me, okay? But um, but the, the idea is that you, you gotta realize that you gotta come back to the community. And this is one of the ways where community can stop looking at people who have done something as well, right? So that, when I think about restorative, I think about it more from the community and the family, the victims of everybody. Just the thought. Okay, we got some more questions here. Um, and uh, how many offenders have gone through Stride? So we, uh, we're in our second cohort. Our first cohort that has fully completed the program, I want to say that you know, we started, we always start with a number and you lose people along the way. Um, our first cohort, I want to say we finished with 12. Mm -hmm. And our second cohort has just uh, begun. Okay, cool. Are there any other Metro um, DAs reaching out to you to re replicate these smart, effective justice initiatives? <laughs> Not yet, but I hope they do. <laughs> well, we have to help you get that out. <laughs> um let me see permission for the link for to this record recorded session oh okay we'll do that we'll send the link out um 
what percent of potential restorative justice cases are you serving now? And how can we help to get that closer to 100%? Oh, well, uh, wow, 100%. I mean, I think for us, it's just continuing to build on, on what, on, on what we can do. And, 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 and let's be honest, not, not every case is a restorative justice case. You know, um, we have victims of sexual assault. Uh, we have victims of domestic violence. We have victims, um, in, you know, armed robberies where, you know, restorative justice is, like I said, it, it means that there has to be two parties willing to participate in the process. Um, a victim that is at a stage where they're willing to accept response, you know, accept an apology um, and an offender that's willing to acknowledge their part in the harm. Um, and believe it or not, it's not easy to get two people on the same case where it's appropriate. Um, and so we are striving in my office to identify those places where we think it's appropriate. And we do that through our victim witness advocates. I mean, our victim witness advocates are engaging with the victims and they can tell us, hey, I've got a victim here that I think is open, right? Um, to participate in this level of process. And then there are victims that really aren't. They have been harmed in a way that they are not in a place and we have to meet everybody where they are. Um, and sometimes restorative justice comes at a later date because honestly, sometimes restorative justice comes very much so for people that go to prison. And five years in or 10 years in, now a victim and the offender are both willing to engage in a restorative process, what I, which I think is equally important um, because it does give a measure of closure potentially for a victim. And it gives a measure of hope for someone that even if they have to be incarcerated for the harm that they have brought to a victim or the community, that when they do get out, there is um, that forgiveness that perhaps they've been able to gain fuels their desire to be successfully ret be a, a return to the community. Um, so restorative justice doesn't potentially just um, mean, you know, obviously if, if we can make it a part of the court proceeding, that's great. But we also recognize that sometimes people just aren't there yet. But it doesn't mean that time won't give them the opportunity to, to engage in that in that restoration down the line. Okay, it's at eight o'clock. I don't think I don't think I missed. Did I miss another question? Bert, Bert did I get all the questions? I think Bert took off, but uh, oh. I think that's all. No, the I'm, I'm here. Oh, he's um, here. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, it looks like there's uh, Tom Woodward. Well, had a had a he, comment, I guess. You just have a comment. And there's um, about it, it, uh, closure. Then above that, let's see. Look, or here's another. Um, yeah, I see one. Uh, what levels of education are being offered to offenders going through this program, and what certifications? licenses or degrees have been attained by these individuals who have transitioned through the restorative justice initiative. Through STRIDE, you mean? Through STRIDE, is it STRIDE? That's what I was thinking. STRIDE program? Okay, I will say this. We were very fortunate um, that our first cohort of, cohort of STRIDE participants mm -hmm. in partnership with DeKalb County, um, the CEO offered every um, successful participant of our program at their online graduation the opportunity to have employment in DeKalb County. That was um, something that I asked the CEO to do and he readily agreed. And so everyone that graduated from that program um, was offered the ability to apply for um, and gain employment within the DeKalb County government system. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. So, I, that with you, 
you need a job, you'll get a job. <laughs> yes. And that's, you know, I, I would say the vast majority of our participants, that was their number one issue was, was seeking successful employment, especially when COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if we had, um, and, and keep in mind, you know, DeKalb County all, also now guarantees a livable wage. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about jobs with um, a, uh, a livable hourly wage plus benefits mm -hmm. to people that couldn't get anybody to even consider them. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is an amazing example of what we're going to continue to do. And I hope that the CEO will continue to offer that opportunity for anyone that graduates from our program. Yes, we will. We will support you in making sure that our CEO offers that. <laughs> um, just Tom, Tom, you're right. It is, it's very, uh, we don't, what we're doing in criminal justice, so we might need Tom to come with us, Bert, um, and be a part of the criminal justice. We are seeking ways to get, um, the, educate our community on restorative justice so that we can better get people to help with um, when um, DEH is trying to create that circle. <laughs> I keep saying it's a circle because of Healing Justice movie. But um, yeah, so you're right on that, Tom. It is hard. Uh, people don't want to communicate. I mean, look at us. Sometimes we don't want to get along. So, um, so. Mm -hmm. all right, Tom. Tom's going to help us. Okay, good, Tom. <laughs> all right. Um, so I didn't see anything else, um, DA Sherry. Is there any closing remarks you have for us? Anything no, you thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I am so happy to have the opportunity to discuss what's happening in the DA's office. And I will continue to um, come back at, <laughs> at your invitation. Um, and I will just say that I wholeheartedly appreciate the support that the NAACP has given me uh, in all the endeavors that I have pursued in justice and decab over the last um, 11 years. Wow. Um, and I'm grateful um, for the work that you do. Um, and um, I'm grateful that you have held me accountable. <laughs> I, mean, I really am. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being supportive, Dad. I mean, and plus educating me. I mean, literally, I had to be educated. I'm not a lawyer, DA, none of that. I'd be like, I'm on the human side, community side. <laughs> breaking it down for us, but we really appreciate you. Everyone is saying, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you.